check this out. We've got something really fun today. This is so amazing. Math and math. Oh man, again? Let's warm up and simplify these expressions. So this one, we could square the eight first and then take the cubed root. So the denominator of the exponent is the index of the radical. Now eight squared is 64. And then we just need to do the cubed root of 64, which is four. Now we could have done this a different way. We could uh, cube root it first, and this might be actually easier, especially if you didn't have a calculator. So let's do the cubed root of eight and then square that result. So the cubed root of eight is two and two squared is four. For this one, we have a mixture of exponential and radical form. So I find it easier to work in exponential form. So the first thing I'm gonna do is convert this radical to an exponent. And it shows no index here. So I know the default index is two and that would go in the denominator of my exponent. And now I can multiply those together. So I've got x squared, and that's all squared minus x squared, and x squared plus x squared is 2x squared. And when we have something in brackets and it's all squared, we need to square both. So a common mistake I see is students forgetting to square this one. So this would be 4x to the power of 4 minus x squared. And this would be good enough. I've heard people say that we always need to factor our final answer, and that's a ridiculous rule. If I was going to take the derivative of this next, I'd want it left just like this. If I was going to use this in a rational expression, then yes, I would want it factored. So it really depends on the context, but this looks pretty simple to me. 2.1, radical functions and transformations. A radical function is a function that has a radical sign with any index, and the variable has to be in the radicand. Now the radicand is the part underneath the radical sign. This straight horizontal bar is called a vinculum, and the index sits above the crook of the radical. And that's very important. If we wanted to write the cubed root of two, we'd need to put the cubed or the three here above the crook. If you're a bit sloppy and you do this, this is going to be marked wrong because this is three times root two. Now, which are radical functions? This one, we've got a variable under, in the radicand. This one is not. Although it has a radical, the variable isn't in here. This is actually linear with a slope of one and a y-intercept of root two. This one, yes. And this one, yep. What does a radical function look like when graphed? Let's graph our most basic y equals the square root of x using a table of values. Now I put negative one here. The square root of negative one is not real. So that won't be showing up on our graph. It's actually imaginary, but we don't use imaginary numbers in the course math 30-1. The square root of zero is not a problem, it is zero. The square root of one is one, square root of four is two, and square root of nine is three. And you notice I picked these perfect squares so we'd get some nice square roots. So graphing this look like that, and we need to connect these points because this graph is continuous. And let's label it y equals root x. Now let's do the domain and range, and we'll do it in interval notation. So looks like our minimum domain is zero, and then it proceeds on from there. And same with the range, minimum is zero, proceeds on. This is our most basic radical function, and from this we can draw other radical functions using a table of values, applying transformations, or using mapping notation. Let's see how we will do that.
graph y equals 2 times the square root of x plus 3 using a table of values. Now we're going to make the table of values here, but you could get the table of values from your calculator, putting this into y1, and then just looking at the table that your calculator produces for you. Now the first one I chose was negative 3 because that's a nice number. It will make the radicand 0, and the square root of 0 is 0, and 0 times 2 is still 0. Now the next useful number would probably be negative 2. If I went to negative 4, my radicand would be negative, and then my answers wouldn't be real. So negative 2 plus 3 is 1, square root of 1 is 1, and 2 times 1 is 2. Uh, negative 1 is not a particularly useful one because it gives us an irrational answer, so let's go to not 0, how about positive 1? And that gives us a perfect uh, square radicand, so 1 plus 3 is 4, square root of 4 is 2, and 2 times 2 is 4. The next useful number will probably be 6, and that will give us a radicand of 9, square root of 9 is 3, and 3 times 2 is 6. And the last one we'll need is about 13. Square root of 16 is 4, times 2 is 8. Now let's plot these points. So negative 3, 0, negative 2, 2, 1, 4, and 6, 6 will be the last point that fits on this connect the points, and let's call this y equals 2 root x plus 3. The domain in interval notation b negative 3 to infinity, and the range 0 to infinity. Let's do the domain and range in set builder notation. So we've got our bracket here, and our variable is x is such that x is greater than or equal to negative 3, and x is a real number, and our range y is such that y is greater than or equal to 0, and y is also a real number. And you need to know both of these forms for domain and range. Graph y equals the square root of 0.5x plus 1 by applying transformations to our most basic radical function. So we're going to compare this to y equals the square root of x. And what transformations occurred to turn it into this function here? So this is not in our convenient transformation form. We can't see the transformations. And that's because this 0 0.5 is not factored out. So when we want to see our transformations, this needs to be factored out. So normally we would have it like this. A is out there, F, and then B is here. And it's factored out from our H, um, X minus H here. Okay, so that's very important. So we're not moving one unit to the left, as you will see, we are factoring the 0 0.5 out, and when we do that, this turns into a plus 2. So we're actually horizontally stretching it by a factor of 2 and translating left 2 units. And that's why it's very important to remember you've got to factor this out. Now that we have those transformations, let's, let's remember our first graph. It started here, like our most basic y equals square root of x. It started here at the origin and went here and then here and so on. Now we're going to stretch it first. So horizontally stretch by a factor of 2. So that means this one, and it's about the y-axis. So we stretch both ways around the y-axis. So all the points are getting stretched this way. Everything's on the right of the y-axis here. So this point's not going anywhere. This point, though, stretches to here. And this point stretches to 8, which is actually off my graph. Now translate left two units. So this point goes left two units, and it's right there. So we'll make these points a bit bigger. This one goes left two units, so it's there. 
And this one goes left two units, and so it's there. So our new transformed graph looks like that. Y equals the square root of 0.5x plus 1. And you can write uh, this one here, where it's factored out, or you can write this here. Now our domain, we would say negative 2 to infinity, and our range, 0 to infinity. Graph y equals 2 times the square root of negative x plus 3. By using mapping notation on our most basic radical function, y equals the square root of x. And here is the table of values from that function. Now, same problem as last time, we can't see the transformations because this reflection isn't factored out. So the first thing I'm going to do is to change this so that I can see the transformations properly. So y equals 2 and the square root of negative, I'm going to factor it out, and then x minus 3. And you see, before I might have looked at this and thought, hey, this is going to be 3 units to the left. Now I can see that that's not the case. It's actually 3 units to the right. So now that I can see the transformations clearly, I'm going to make my mapping notation so I can take each one of these points and find where it went. So our x would be reflected and then shifted 3 units to the right. Our y is just vertically stretched by a factor of 2. Now we're ready to get a, get a set of points. Now this first point I just put in for fun, it's, it's not a point on the graph, but then I know that um, I shouldn't have a graph there when I'm drawing this. So negative 1, put in negative 1 here, it becomes positive 1 plus 3 is 4. And uh, a point that's not there is still not there. So I shouldn't have any graph at x equals 4. Okay, so that's my check. Uh, 0, I put 0 in here, and I get 3. And I put 0 in here, and I get 0. Put 1 in here, and I get 2. I put 1 in here, and I get 2. 4 in here, I get negative 1. 2 in here, 4. And 9 is negative 6. And 3 in here is positive 6. So now I have a set of points, and now I can graph it. So... Again, nothing at 4, 3, 0 is where the graph starts to 2, negative 1, 4, and negative 6, 6. And we'll connect these points here. And I'll just use this as my label. Now our domain and range. Looks like we got a lot of room, so let's use set builder notation this time. So we've got x is such that, x is less than or equal to 3, and x is all the real numbers, less than or equal to 3. And our range is y is such that, y is greater than or equal to 0, and any real number greater than or equal to 0. The graph y equals the cube root of x by using a table of values. You can get this table of values from your calculator, or you can just make one here. Pause the video, give it a try, start the video when you're done. Now I chose perfect cubes so that my cubed root will give me some nice answers. And in this case, cubed root of negative 8 is negative 2, cubed root of negative 1, and so on. All gives me some nice answers. Now I can plot those points on this graph and draw my graph. And they're a bit far apart, so you might want to graph it just to see a picture of this. But this has a nice slope here like this. And then this is concave up. And then this next part is concave down and continues on here and here. Okay, so our domain is all real numbers. Our range is also all real numbers. Now, hopefully this is a review from grade 10, but if the index is odd, we can take the root of negative numbers, no problem.
And if the index is even, we cannot take the root of the negative numbers using the real number set. Find the equation of this function from its graph. So we probably want to list the transformations and then put the numbers that we found into the equation. So let's see what we notice. We notice that this is going down and normally it goes up here. So there was obviously a vertical reflection over the x-axis. Next thing, normally it would go up one and over one. Now it goes down two and over one. So that means that there was a vertical stretch by a factor of two about the x-axis. Next, usually it starts here, but we've moved the starting, kind of starting position over three units. So this would be a horizontal shift three units right. And that looks like all the transformations that happened. Now I can just put it into my equation. So y equals vertical reflection and stretch is outside, so negative two, the square root of x minus three. And then I could graph this on my calculator and make sure this is what I got. What's the equation of the function graphed below? Pause the video, see if you can get it, and restart when you have it. But first thing that we notice is that there's a horizontal reflection because now it's heading off to the left. Normally it goes to the right. So there is a horizontal reflection over the y-axis. And now it goes up one and over four, whereas before it goes up one over one. So there's also a horizontal stretch by a factor of four. Now, if you got something else, that's okay. We'll talk about that in a minute. We also shifted right four units. And that looks like all the transformations. Let's put it together into an equation. We've got y equals. This is horizontal, horizontal, and horizontal. So everything's going to be inside as we've listed them here. We've got a reflection. We've got a, a stretch by a factor of four. So we want to put one over four in here. And then in brackets, shifted right, so x minus 4. This isn't the only way. You might have seen, and I'll switch colors for this alternate answer, you might have seen that it goes uh, over 1, up a half, but that would be a kind of a guess. You can see it algebraically, though, the square root of 1 quarter is a half. So we could take out this stretch and express it as a vertical stretch instead. So we can't do that with the reflection. And that makes sense. Um, reflecting it vertically isn't going to, it, it would be down here, it isn't going to give us this shape. So we can't take that one out. But we can re-express the horizontal stretch as a vertical stretch. So it'd be one half. And then inside, there's nothing else we can do in here. But this is an alternate answer, and it's perfectly correct as well. This was part of Relations and Functions 13, graphing and analyzing radical functions. And don't worry, they are limited to one radical in those functions. Hopefully you can apply transformations to radical functions and determine the equation of a transformed radical function from its graph. Here's some questions from the textbook. Try them out. See if you know what you're doing.